Hello YouTube. Well today I'm in Bath, Maine at the Maine Maritime Museum and it is on the site of the, one of the boat works here in Bath. They built a lot of ships here including this W.R. Grace and the signals flags mean report me all well. So they had that up as a passing ship as they were going to San Francisco around Cape Horn to let a ship that was headed back the other way be able to tell them that they were fine. So let's look around see what we can find. So as you tour around the world on these ships, you would be picking up some interesting things. There's a uh, Balinese shadow puppet which is all of those are always cool. Uh, boomerang, very interesting knife, as well as, they call this a cash sword, and you see it's made out of um, discs that were uh, copper coins, and an opium pipe. Now, if you saw the video from the Penobscot Museum, and we talked about these portraits and how they were basically the they were painted, the background was painted, and then they would sell the idea of the ship. When the ship came in, and it never came into harbor with all the sails up, but they had painted this way looks real pretty and this one is in what they call leghorn anchorage but it's the recognizable city you know that what the what the uh, country uh, that the were uh, the ship was registered at and the name of the ship so if we look around here now that i know that I can see how these were all done. Now I'm looking for ones that are have the same. Actually, I saw the, this background at that uh, other museum. And of course, you send ships out to sea, and a lot of them get lost. There's at least 1,300 that have broken up, sunk off the coast of Maine, and. So we're going to look at some of the, how they did some salvage and such. Now that ring right there, that belonged to Captain William Wiley. And he was the captain of the Alfred D. Snow. He was lost in a storm off the southern coast of Ireland in 1888. And the, the entire crew was lost but they were able to identify his body when they found it by that ring. So one of the advances in ship recovery and salvage was this type of diving suit with the weighted shoes to sink you down, lots of weights, because basically it was just pumped full of air and he had a couple of guys, or at least one guy, up on top cranking this rotary air compressor to push the air down the hose to the guy in the suit. And of course, nowadays, you've got the scuba tanks and wet suits to be able to go down. And uh, as long as you're not below the, the dive limits, you will go down and you got of course not all ships would have been lost out in the ocean some of them just fell into disrepair sunk in the rivers or bays and this is short film they've got of the uh, Cora F Creasy it's in Bremen Maine and they shot this actually in May so it's like two three months ago but as you can see, the tide comes up over it and 
just slowly rotting away. So actually the, the Creasy was built here in 1902. It was used as a cargo schooner. Um, eventually in 29, it was sold to become a floating nightclub and uh, in Boston. Then it was sold again to a guy who had it towed up here to Bremen and filled it with sand to serve as a breakwater. And he tried to use it as a lobster pound, but that venture failed. So this is them um, salvaging these and a couple of posts from that. Well, you can tell a lot about a ship by, in these paintings, by their sails. The square rigged ones like this, this sail here is the, the mainsail and they were cargo haulers. It took a lot of crew to handle a ship like this because if you're gonna change direction to move the arms, let's see, on this model over here, it'd have a set of ropes here to move this yard arm here and another set like it on the other side. So the guy on the other side, be to change this, he'd have to let it out on this side, pull it on that side. And that's one set for each of these. And then you've got the ropes uh, to for the the other parts. I can't think of what they're called. Well, you can see on this one, then the guys that have to go up to pull the sails up and they'd have to manually pull them up and tie them off. And again, back to this one, imagine how big that sail is. And I'm guessing that these ties that are on here uh, make it a little easier to get that at least halfway up the sail. Now that's the square shit, rigged ones. Now to make it a little easier, because those mainsails, they did a split mainsail. So this is equivalent to that other one, but you didn't have to lift up as much canvas. Still need a lot of people to move the arms around and people above, but it wasn't as hard. Now, then you get, and those fell out of favor eventually because it, it just took so many people to run it. But these is, um, this is the way the schooners are. Now, the sails vertical, it would only take a couple of people to lower this sail because you didn't, you raise the whole thing by this arm, bring it down, up. So you had a, a block and tackle for here and another one that came out to here. So you could lower this down and then you'd tie it off at the bottom. Same at the top, you could bring that down. The only ones that were harder, well, if you, if you were gonna change direction, then you could take and move this and the sails would go slack and then catch where the only things you'd really have to worry about were the sails out here because the way they're tied off, you'd have to furl them and redo them off the other side. So these were much faster and took less people to handle them. So these became uh, a favorite way. So this is a model of the last wooden shipbuilding. Our bath is in the south end. And you can see how they'd build the ships on the ways, which are these rails, and launch them out. So this is the pitch oven. Got a couple of fireboxes underneath. You could burn a lot of scrap wood in and they would melt 
crystallized pine resin like this. Melt it down and then carry it in buckets and use that pitch to seal the decks of the schooners. And sometimes the young boys would grab a little piece of that um, when it was cold, of course, and chew it. It's cheaper than chewing gum, and I've never tried it, but I don't know why. I was an adventurous kid. Well, this sculpture represents the Wyoming, and it was a coastal schooner, 426 feet long, and it could carry 6,000 long tons of coal. She was the largest of, of six, six or seven, sorry, six masted schooners. And these representations of where the masts were are actually 50 feet shorter than what, they, what the actual masts were. And when they built this, this was built in um, 1909, and they couldn't find any uh, trees tall enough to make the masks for this. So these, the masks had to be brought all the way across the country from Washington State. And this was the, I think the largest one that they built here. Here is another shot of the Wyoming from the stern and I don't really realize just how big these were to see a sculpture like this and I was just informed that Maine was a dry state at the time and so they didn't break a bottle of champagne over the bows of the ships. They used a bouquet of flowers. And when they did this sculpture, um, it was originally was christened by one of the sponsors from Wyoming. This is why it's called the Wyoming. And um, when they christened this sculpture, it was done by the great granddaughter of the woman who christened the original ship and they gave her a big bouquet of flowers to do it and she didn't realize that those were going to be a souvenir for her and she whacked the sculpture hard enough that it just totally destroyed uh, that bouquet if you remember from the small boats in uh, the Penobscot Museum same thing for the larger ships that you wanted that strong grain at the bottom here from the roots of a tree for the bottom of the ribs. So people that have watched my build videos, I had a modern version of this mortising machine. Mortising is basically making square holes such as that so that you could make a tenon that would fit in and uh, form that joint. Got a nice display of uh, different kinds of lobster and boats. One thing they all have in common is some sort of pulley winch be able to get those traps up off the bottom, hopefully full. It's got a nice display of the different kinds of lobster traps. It's like end entry, side entry, a double where it come in the middle and go on either side or, or come in the ends and go through, you know, here's a, a modern or metal one. Same idea, go in through one end into the center and into the other end. So this one, and they're made in such a way 
This is the first one I'll be able to see it, where if small ones get in, they can get out through this hole. And that saves a little bit of work if they do that, because use these kind of tools to be able to gauge the um, size, whether they're legal, you know, minimum of uh, three and a quarter, let's say, and maximum of five inches with a four inch select grade. So if it's this on this particular one, if the shell isn't at least that long, it's um, well, it's too small. If it fits in this next one, it's select grade, but if it goes to the top, I'm talking the second one down here. So, and that's, but they also have ones like offshore where you can go bigger, which is out, if you're out more than three miles, and that's a federal regulation. That's the main regu state regulation. So lobster in, in Maine is divided up into different zones where the lobstermen can go and you see all these different buoys uh, that would mark where the pots are. They are all different because they, whereas the lobstermen would register what theirs is. So they would be pulling just theirs and not somebody else's, but also that the um, inspectors could pull one and know whose pot they're making sure is legal. They've got a, a little model here that can show how a ship is launched. And when the ship is built, it, these the ship the keels laid here and they build the ship above it and then build this it's built over these rails that extend out into the water so where we're standing would have been right out through that way um, built the sled with these pieces built up against the hull of the, the ship and when they were ready the, they had to remove these because the ship is still resting on these and they would start here, split this piece, get it, and as they got back at some point that weight of the ship is going to break these but you don't know when that's going to happen. So um, it's got to be a little bit of a nerve-wracking job. So then we've got a ship here this is basically how it would have looked. Uh, the rails all greased, ready to go. And so then break the champagne bottle. You guys kick it loose. And he'd launch the ship. And uh, the buoy here, these uh, Racks would have been out into the water. The buoy would be a way to find it, tow it back in. They could use it again on the next one. So this is the uh, schooner, the Mary E. It was built in 1906. It was the last wooden schooner built here. And they used it, uh, it was fishermen used this for many, many years. And then in uh, 1963, hurricane came through, sunk it. Just the bow was up. And so the great grandson of the guy who owned this boat works raised it, refurbished it. It's gone through a few hands before it uh, came to be owned by the museum. That's going to be the end of my visit here to the Maine Maritime Museum in Bath. You can see behind me over there, way back in the distance, there are still uh, boatyards here. 
That's a big floating dry dock, that blue thing. Uh, they don't make wooden ships anymore, but they do still make some big steel ships here. The um, Mary E is, you know, say goodbye to that, but right behind her is the cruise ship. They can take you out on a river cruise and show you some of the other things, sites, the boat works and so on. I just chose not to today. The cost for the museum was um, $16 for a senior discount and there is a lot to see here. As usual, I did not show you everything. Um, some of my other visits, other maritime museums, we covered a lot of the the different aspects. You've already seen blacksmith shops, rope making, that kind of thing. But this is this has got a um, quite a bit of stuff here. For the price, you can actually come back again within a week. So don't be f feel you have to see it all in one day. But I'm gonna get on the road and see what I can find. All right, something different in the next video. Not a tour one. See you later, YouTube.